A couple of months ago, I stumbled upon a series where they reviewed every single Harry Potter book, and I thought it would be fun to do it with Wings of Fire books. All 20 or so of them. So buckle in, you're about to hear my pure opinion on these dragon books. I'd also like to disclose that I'm recording part of this in my closet. That's right, my closet. So I'm sorry if the audio sounds weird or if there's a tiny bit of an echo. This is the best I can do. This will, of course, contain spoilers, so watch at your own risk. This review covers all the main series books up to the Dangerous Gift, all Winklets, and all of Legends. If you're new to this channel, please think about subscribing. I regularly post Wings of Fire and Warrior Cats content, so you will never be bored. And to my current subscribers, thank you so much for supporting me. Now, without further ado, let's begin. We are pretty obviously starting off with the first book in the series to Dragonet Prophecy. I feel like every Dragonet in this book has their own moment besides for Sunny. Clay sings, Tsunami kills a dragon on her own while staring down Scarlet, Starflight gets reverse kidnapped, and Glory uses her magical death spit, but Sunny gets nothing. Poor Sunny. This is a really nice way to feature the dragons though and show off their strengths and weaknesses. Speaking of Glory using her magical death spit, I really like how it isn't known exactly what it is for the first few books. It builds up the hype for meeting the Rain Wings, who must be more knowledgeable on this topic. And also, you're questioning whether this is a tribe thing like Fire Breath or an individual thing like Peril's Fire Scales. Peril, speaking of her, was a great character and was a highlight of the book. She's oblivious to how cruel she is, but it's the only life she's ever known, and to see her react to poor Sheltered Clay is kinda hilarious. One scene in this book truly stands out to me, which is Vulture and Peril. Peril tries to defend her mother through a power of the champion known as the Champion's Shield. However, the only place where she could have learned it from is Vulture, as Peril cannot read scrolls. Vulture is picked up and dropped by Scarlet. And he doesn't have wings, so he's falling a great distance, and he's no way to pick himself back up. Peril tries to save him, but, you know, she has five skills, and she burns him, and he falls. Anyways, that's really sad. This is, disappointingly, the only Mudwing focused book, and from what I can see in this book, they are a pretty neat gang. I love the Sibs, it is obviously supposed to reflect on the dragon as a destiny, and hint at them being found family. Overall, pretty solid book and a good introduction to Wings of Fire, I'm gonna give it an A. Up next is The Lost Air. I love the attempt of an arc that Tui tries to have with the protagonist, Tsunami. She is shown to be aggressive at the start, attacking a Skywing who would have otherwise not seen them. After it is revealed that the same wing she killed in the last book was her father, I thought she would be more hesitant about attacking and perhaps would have a moment where she spares a dragon attacking her, where she could have killed them. Perhaps the one who initially tried to kidnap her, but nothing like that ever occurred. Blister was a bit of a letdown, we're always told she's smart, but we aren't shown that in this. She immediately comes off as creepy. It's a wonder she has any allies, Whirlpool is just as creepy as Blister, and he just makes me shiver. Coral is absolutely wonderful, she's abusive, she's a mess, and is lost in her own fairy tale land. She runs on book logic, and thinks for some reason that the dragon who has been under a mountain for 70 years has somehow been destroying her eggs, because it would, and I quote, make the most sense. Also, poor Riptide, his mother was sent into the battle of a sight only being a cook because of his father's actions. I wonder who raised him because he would have only been three at the time, just a year older than Cliff and a year younger than Moon. I don't really like his relationship with Tsunami though, it feels a tiny bit too forced, but I can see why it happens. I just don't think it could have been romantic, I don't see the chemistry. This book gains a B from me, it's pretty chill. The Hidden Kingdom is the third book in the series. I don't like how Glory is constantly looking down on her tribe throughout the book. You can tell that the dislike of Rainwings is still by her by the Guardians is still there, and I don't feel like she improved on that much in any of the sequels. I think the reveal that Nightwings living on a crappy island was pretty well done. It starts sowing the seeds of doubt in the validity of the tribe, and also later the prophecy itself. Also, once again, we get an obligatory romance. This time, it's Glorybringer. I have a lot to say about that, however, I'm gonna keep that to myself until the Assassin Winglet review. The way the Rainwings crown queens is pretty cool and slightly foreshadows the unorthodox way the three sisters vie for the throne in the final book of this arc. I was also happy that you didn't choose a DoD to compete in the trials, as we gotta learn the background characters better and had payoffs for some setups, such as Kingaju and her Venom training. I'm glad that she got to be queen by the end of this book and stop finding the place where she belongs. It also makes the DoD more of a legitimate political power, as now they have a queen who will back them up and not try to imprison them like Coral did. This book deserves a B. 
The Dark Secret's name refers to the fact that the dragon it prophecy is fake. Whoops, sorry to spoil it. The Nightwing tribe is pretty thin right now. We are told that in the dormitory meant for hundreds, there are only a dozen or so dragonettes. It's pretty apparent that the Nightwings are entering a genetic bottleneck, and just like the Hivewings, some inbreeding might be occurring. I find it highly likely that the Nightwings will start looking for other dragons beyond their tribal boundaries, like Rainwings, considering their current territory. In the future, this may lead to the creation of a new tribe called Stormwings, a merged tribe between the two. The obligatory in the romance in this book is slightly better. I can understand the chemistry in this book, and they keep the chemistry in books following this one. Fate Speaker keeps the Starflight side at JMA, but I don't think we're ever told what she teaches there. It's better than Riptide, who only met Tsunami once, however, somehow they're in a relationship. Battle Winner is so cool, but man, am I angry that we don't have a novella about her. I'd love to learn why she was trying to interfere with the Ice Wings and would want to know how Mastermind made the lava technology. Speaking of Megamind, I love him. He's delightful. He's like Coral, but with science, he does terrible things in the name of his work. This book was pretty chill. It gets an A from me. The Brightest Night is Sunny's book. It's pretty hard to top the reveals of the last book, which would logically mean that the war shouldn't end, but it ends anyway thanks to the stour efforts of Sunny. I am a bit of a Sunny stan. I won't gush too much about her here, but if you want to hear more of that, check out my video, Are the DoD Toxic to Sunny? The addition of the Scorpion Den adds a lot more color to the world. The alcohol seem a tiny bit too nice though. I wish we got to see a bit more of their shady side because they have to get the money for feeding orphans from somewhere. Probably drugs. Thorn was pretty good. She's the kindest adult in the series besides Grandeur, and it's nice to see at least one of the Dragonettes has a good role model and a good parent. The ending of this book didn't feel too much like a cop-out either, despite Thorn winning. I feel like Burn was perhaps a tiny bit too stupid to fall for this two snakes in one box trick. That's the oldest one in the book, literally. This book is also the first one that doesn't contain an obligatory romance. Admittedly, there wasn't much time staying in one place where she could have met anyone, but I'll count it as a win. Considering all that, I think it's no surprise I'm going to give this book a solid S, the first one on this list. Moon, the namesake of this book, hits the peak of her character in this book, which is bad because this book is literally her debut. For the rest of the series, she's just a rag whose personality is just shyness. Many other dragons were introduced in this book. My favorite of these dragons is Mighty Claws the Art Dragon. He's just so chill, and he only does things because he wants to help others. The mystery aspect of this book was relatively well done. Sora was perfectly foreshadowed. She can hide her thoughts through meditation, meaning Moon wasn't able to find out who she was and was and her being suspiciously obsessed with Icicle. Icicle being another murderer could have been a bit better foreshadowed, but still a good twist. Moon isn't too overpowered in this book because Sora found a way to get around her powers, and also Onyx has her own power shadowing ability that she can use. I wish we got funerals for all the dragonettes who died in this book. From what I know, Charmeleon got one. Carnelian got one. Like, some names in these books are too similar, I'm sorry. But Big Tail didn't. I feel like two dragonettes dying should have been a bigger deal, especially since bombs are involved. My favorite scene from this book is when Moon talks to Sunny about her powers. I think that Tui's writing shines when the characters take a second to slow down and enjoy the roses, and this scene definitely hit the mark. Most of the other dragonettes aren't good, though. I don't see most of them being good as teachers, and they sh probably should have to hire some extra help, as they aren't the most experienced and haven't had the best education themselves. I'm surprised that this book reached a B marking for me. I thought it would come la lower on this list, but wasn't a surprise. I accidentally ordered two copies of Winter Turning when it first came out. Fortunately, that didn't matter because my friend JT stole one of them or rather forgot to give it back. He promised he'd give it back and he didn't and he said, oh, they're at my dad's house. And then when he went to his dad's house, he forgot to bring them back and after a while, I just stopped asking. I am still annoyed to the state about that. During Moon Rising, Winter was mainly an asshole, kind of like the friend who stole my book, who was implied to have some depth. We didn't fully relate to him, but in this book, we get to see his backstory starting from page one and get to understand the choices he makes. There is one thing I don't understand about this book, though, which is when Winter tells Icicle to tell Scarlet that if she can provide proof that Hailstorm is still alive, he would kill Glory. However, a few chapters later, Scarlet threatens to kill Hailstorm because Glory is still alive. Of course, Winter wouldn't have killed Glory. You haven't provided proof that he's still alive yet. 
Possibility was really cool. I enjoyed seeing the blends of culture in it, such as the Full Moon Festival from the Sandwings, which I suspect was appropriate for the Nightwings during Darkstalkers' time. I like the Diamond Trial, however, the fact that it's rigged isn't surprising. Even if it wasn't, the lowest ranked dragon is not likely to be stronger than the highest ranked one. Without instructions, they'd probably still try to murder each other, so the outcome is pretty much guaranteed. I feel like it isn't talked enough in the fandom about the fact that Foslayer died hundreds of times because of the trial. I'm decently sure some fans don't even remember that part and assume that she had been asleep like Darkstalker based off of how few posts that I've seen about it, and by that I mean there's possibly only one map relating to it, Frozen Heart. This book is a B tier, could have been better, but I'm satisfied with what we got. Escaping Pearl is my favorite book in the second arc. It was a nice break from the dark soccer plotline that I didn't see going much anywhere. It was a book with no relevance towards the end of the series besides Charmeleon, but yet I love it so much. Pearl is one of the most active characters in Wings of Fire. What I love about her is that she has no morals, she's insane, Glory and Tsunami have killed dragons and would do so if their life was in danger, but Pearl literally tried to kill Winter because she was having a bad day. I'm not exaggerating, that's what happened. She is so unhinged. I love her so much. My only complaint is how she's a tiny bit, uh, yandere for Clay. I hate using that word so much, but it's the truth. She's obsessed, and it's the only reason for her being a good person. It's kind of like Winter and Moon, but just gender swapped, and I hate it. I can see where it came from, though. She's been abused and deprived of love for her whole life, so of course the first dragon to treat her with any degree of respect she idolizes. But if Clay makes one bad comment about a student, I can see that Dragonette's bed going up in flames real fast. I once again like Possibility as a setting. It's a charming place, and it makes the dragon world just a tiny bit more fleshed out. Tui's promise that we will spend more time in the city too, specifically focusing on the ruling power, which is called the Enclave. The dynamic between Scarlet, Charmeleon, and Peril was really fun to read after she got her powers taken away. Charmeleon genuinely cares about Peril, but not enough that he doesn't enchant her rudely. Scarlet thinks she has control over Charmeleon, but Charmeleon really only cares for himself. This book is definitely A tier. It's a lot of fun to read, even if it is a tiny bit cliched and all the plot twists you can see coming, but Peril just makes this entire thing worthwhile. On to the next book, Talents of Power. Turtle is one of my favorite characters because his book gives him a definite arc, which is rare to find in the series. In the beginning, he went to Jade Mountain to get help, but in the end, he chases down the danger himself, all alone. He's also very sympathetic. We understand why he acts the way he does, he just really wants attention from his parents to make up for the time he was blamed for one of his siblings' deaths. All of this to say that Turtle is the Chad version of Blue, and Blue is just rip-off Turtle. I'm a tiny bit disappointed that we never got to learn whether Flame was enchanted to attack Stone Mover or if he did that out of his own volition. I personally do not believe he did. The reason he did the reason he gave for attacking him was incredibly stupid. Why didn't he go to Darkstalker to get his face healed? And if he did, did he get enchanted to kill Stone Mover instead? I like the twist of an enemy being enchanted by Turtle, however, it makes Animus Magic too overpowered if anyone can be given it. Animus Magic is overpowered already, you can create other dragons from it, such as Jerboa. And I suspect that if Darkstalker had an ounce less of civility in him, and he would have he could he would have decided to bring back Clear Sight, and he would have been able to do so. I'd love to see more of Turtle and an enemy's relationship though. I thought we'd get to see at least one close conversation in them between DoD, but it doesn't happen unfortunately. I don't like the pawning off of the name of this book for the organization that Vulture runs. I feel like it should be a more exclusive title, um, but this book is still an A tier to be sure of it. Darkness of Dragons is a pretty controversial book, but let me give my unbiased opinion on it. It's a tiny bit rushed, despite being the longest main series WOF book, they still should have slowed down and used more time. The book probably could have been separated in two, one in the Sand Kingdom and one in the Night Kingdom, and that would have worked better. In the Sand Kingdom part, I really enjoyed the chemistry between Kivali and Winter, and really saw what Tui meant when she said anyone in the Kivali, Winter, Moon Triangle is shippable. They were very fun to watch. Also, props to Tui for not adding homophobia and having Vulture actually encourage their relationship for trading reasons. For some reason, fantasy offers, even ones who claim to be allies, don't often realize that it's fantasy where you can do whatever you want and you don't have to add homophobia for some reason, and your same-sex couple can be together without anyone questioning it. I'm glad this series doesn't have that pitfall. 
Cobra being a spy was an expected twist, but even though it wasn't expected, it still hurt a lot, as I'm sure it did for Ghibli. Poor guy. A lot of things are set up in this book or in previous ones that pay off, such as Faux Slayer, the Soul Reader, and the Weather Gauntlets. Everything came together in the end in a way that was incredibly satisfying to see. Though I don't agree with all the authorial choices in this book, this book is a solid B for me. Now it's time to talk about the last release, Dark and Wings of Fire, The Lost Continent Prophecy. First of all, I hate the protagonist Blue so much, you can watch my video on that. Blue is your pathetic protagonist if you want to know more about that, but to keep it simple. Blue is a blank slate character who is too much of a blank slate. He's also reactive rather than proactive, which isn't the best thing to have in a protagonist. The romance between Blue and Cricket seems rushed. I've noticed that most het romances in the series are, such as the ones formed in only one book like Glory and Deathbringer, Tsunami, and Riptide, and also Clay and Peril, but once again, understandable in that situation. With the exceptions of Dark Stalker and Clearside, Moon and Keebly, and Thor and Smolder, it's just true. According to Blue, the anklet worn by all Silkwings releases a toxin into their body if they turn up missing, which implies that Hivewings have advanced technology and something would have to be used to signal it, like a radio wave. However, no advanced Hiving technology was ever revealed, so the anklet just seems out of place in this low-tech world. That's pretty much all I have to say about this book. The rest of it is in the analysis video that I mentioned at the start of this section. Regrettably, this book earns an F. The Hive Queen was a great book and it introduced us to the flip side of culture in the hives. Scarab is an absolute darling and I love and cherish her so much. She sticks up for the little guy and is the snarkiest, meanest old lady ever and she deserves to act that way. Jewel is on thin ice though, even though she supports Silk Wings, she's just a tiny bit self-absorbed. The Glitter Bazaar is cool, I always love a chance to draw characters in outlandish outfits they'd never otherwise wear. It is an underutilized backdrop for fanfiction and maps so, and it's one of the most carefree and unique places in Peria and Pentala. The reveal of Cricket's quote-unquote mother being her grandmother was honestly unexpected. I honestly thought that Cricket would turn out to be a Silk Hive hybrid, and that's why she was immune to mind control. But Occam's Razor won over, and of course the simpler answer is the one that wins out. I hope everyone in her family becomes unmind controlled and her parents get back together again. Everyone in Cricket's family suffered so much. I didn't expect nor want the source of the hive mind to be a plant. Some types of wasps are parasitic, so I thought it could be Queen Wasp having a rare hiving ability. The antagonist of the arc being literal plant is a tiny bit anticlimactic, and it's harder to hate a plant than a dragon. I am interested in why Cricket doesn't have a Venom ability, because every Hivewing naturally has them, even if they aren't under control of the hive mind. so why doesn't she have one? Is she just disabled? Also, that plant is an ancient evil, like Darkstalker, and it also controls dragons, like Darkstalker. So it's the same villain concept in essence. The only difference is that there is a better potential for horror, cough cough, than the Nowhere King map. This book was a solid A, nothing detracted from it too much, and had plenty of twists and turns to keep the reader's attention. The Poisonous Jungle was mainly a traveling book, so it was pretty boring. Thankfully, the chemistry between the traveling dragons kept it from being too skippable. I don't like Bumblebee too much though, I find that ridden children and toddler characters tend to be a tiny bit annoying to me, and unrealistic to how real children act. Actually, it is realistic because I believe Bumblebee gets one dragon almost eaten by a carnivorous plant, which is something a two-year-old who doesn't understand how carnivorous plants work would do. Oh, and can we just talk about them for a second? I was unsure of how repeating a rainforest habitat would end up being, and I feared it would just be a repeat of the one in Peria, but was thankfully disproven. The poisonous and killer plants were just really fun obstacles, and they added a dash of color. The leaf speak was also cool. I understand where Tubi got the idea from. Plants, mainly trees, can actually communicate and share energy through their roots. I, however, do not believe that the fin on the end of the leafwing's tails is exclusive to those who can speak leaf speak. I feel like it was a tiny bit of an error in the artist's communication. Willow and Sundew have an amazing relationship, and it is one of the best main series romances, and I do not hate it like I hate the others. Every book seems to have an obligatory romance, but this is the only one that I'm not angry at. 
The reason for this has to be that unlike Tsunami and Riptide, Clay and Peril, Glory and Deathbringer, or Starflight and Faith Speaker, they have known each other for a while, and the romance is not started and rushed during the events of this book. 10 out of 10 best romance. The other mind was pretty good in this book, however, that is because it was given an actual face for us to fear, that being Hawthorne, and I was pretty disappointed that he perished within this book. This book is another A for the Lost Continent Prophecy. The Dangerous Gift didn't have a lot of action in it, and it was mainly filler in my opinion, permeated by the occasional Other Dragons perspective chapter, where we actually got to see where the action was happening. This is the closest thing Wings of Fire has to an average Warrior Cats book with how much talking and not doing it has. Them introducing scavengers to the general population wasn't the development I wanted. Wings of Fire is supposed to be a dragon book, not a dragon rider book, and I didn't want the focus to be shifted like this. The characterization in this book was real nice, though I like seeing Snowfall grow up, I feel like there was no real reason for us to root for her to become more mature. I feel like seeing her and Mink interact and her show a soft spot could have shown us a reason to cheer for her development. Winter's characterization definitely hits the spot for me. We get to see him respectfully interact with Moon, even though he doesn't want to talk about the events from the past, but with them are getting over it. While this book was mainly talking, I feel I like what was being said. All the relationships in this book felt fleshed out, and my favorite has got to be between Thorn and Snowfall, where Thorn tries to cheer Snowfall up and give her tips on being a queen. I know that she was thinking of Sunny during that entire interaction and what she would do if Sunny ever became queen. My second favorite relationship was Jerbo and Glacier and how initially Snowfall views them as business partners. However, as she becomes more compassionate, she realizes that they're actually friends. Speaking of Jerboa, her chapter saved the entire book for me. I was ready to write the book off and it's entirely skippable and then blam, straight in the feels. This book is C tier, I tolerate it, but I don't think that Snowfall should have been chosen for this book. That's all for the main series book, so let's move on to Winglets. Starting with Assassin. The one problem I do have in this book is how it changes the timeline of when Deathbringer is born, hence making this ship Glorybringer a tiny bit pedophilic to say the least. Glory is 7 by the time the Hidden Kingdom comes around, and Deathbringer is 13 at the least. While dragons mature around the age of 8 and then slow down maturing, this still leaves Gloria at the human equivalent of around 17, while Deathbringer is around 23 to 25, which is a common age of grooming, as college students take advantage of young high schoolers. Do not despair, fellow shippers, as there's another ship that also involves the Rainwing royal family that you might like. Hear me out, John Boobringer. Now think about it, both of them like teasing Glory and being like older brothers to her. I've noticed that their relationships with Glory are relatively similar, making this ship to me even a tiny bit weird back then. While Jambu's teasing may be intentional, I have a feeling he would laugh a lot at how Deathbringer could embarrass his sister. Even though this ship doesn't replace a guard protected dynamic, I have to say that Fathom Go, aka Fathom and Indigo, did it 10 times better, as there's a lot of longing there and it isn't just a guard yelling at their charge a thousand times, hey, like me, you know I'm sexy, which isn't funny. It's sexual harassment and possibly pedophilia. The rest of this book is perfectly fine. Vengeance and Slaughter were a tiny bit 2D for me, but we didn't get to see much of them. A perfectly fine book, besides her pedophilia, I have to rate it a B. Next up, Prisoner. First of all, this book has a different format to every other written entry of Wings of Fire. Instead of being written through flat prose, it is instead a series of letters being passed between Fierceith and the guard of the Sandwing Stronghold, Zagaro. Second, when I first read this novel, I pretty much dismissed it and thought nothing would ever happen in this novel that would ever be relevant again. Well, Rogan with no reading comprehension and no sense that writers like to save villains in their back pocket, they did come out, causing me to reread this novella and be like, damn, I should have seen the clues. I feel like this book is very overlooked in the fandom. I don't think I've ever seen an AMV of the content from it, so I'm going to be looking out for songs that fit it. Overall, this book is a B tier. Runaway is the most popular winglet by far. It has several maps dedicated to it and several more which include scenes from its pages. First of all, Arctic and Foslayer are in love at first sight. I thought that their relationship occurred over a series of peace talks until Arctic left and Foslayer did as well, but nope, it all happened in one meeting. Second of all, there is a better romance in his book, Snow Snow aka Fox Lake. I just love to see two girl bosses winning. I love that they engineered the entire Night Icewing War pretty much be a snowflake didn't like Arctic. Petty drama that I live for. I don't think this book was need to understand the Night Icewing War, but it was pleasant anyways. This book is a solid B. Deserter is honestly the best winglet, and I will not apologize for that opinion. 
It gives some much needed context for the War of the Sandwing Secession and the politics surrounding it. It also gives background on not just Six Claws, the newest Sandwing general, but also Smolder, the last remaining Sandwing prince, and Dune, one of the guardians. Smolder and Six Claws seem friendly to each other in this book, and I have no doubts their friendship picked up again after the war ended, even with the omission of Dune, who is now deceased. Kindle, Six Claws' wife, was also introduced in this book. I can definitely see how they got together, and have no surprises a dragon as bright as ostrich came from them. Out of all winglets, this one needs some app the most. Guess I better get into it. This book goes into my A section. Oh, Dragon Slayer, where can I start? A lot of people hate this book, claiming that it represents a turn from dragon-focused book series to one more sun around humans than it that happens to have dragons, which is all too common. There's barely any dragon-focused book series. I'm going to try and remain impartial here to that, and not to become suspicious that this might end up being a dragon writing series, and acknowledge it for rather for what it is rather than what it could be. Dragon Slayer uses too much callbacks to previous books. This is meant to inspire nostalgia in readers and be like, remember that scene? Kind of like Endgame did. However, it seems to interfere and makes up for the lack of certain things in the book and even sometimes contradicts the plot of other books. Sky and Ren were the highlight to this book. I like Sky's optimism and naivety. Despite his age, it feels realistic because he didn't grow up with much knowledge of the war or around other dragons. I think it will be interesting when he and his sister meet because Pro hates a lot of things, but Sky loves everything. Leaf chapters were a tiny bit boring. I just really wanted to skip all of them, but I didn't. We got to see the Sky Palace again, but this was just book one from a different perspective. Once again, the callbacks are a tiny bit too prevalent. Ivy is pretty cool, though. I can relate on being the third wheel friend who likes to draw a tiny bit too much, though. And I may or may not have kinned her for a short while after the release of this book. Like a large number of Wings of Fire books, I'm going to have to give this one a B. I don't want to end this review on a sad note, so let me tell you about my favorite book in Wings of Fire. If you have a friend who thinks Wings of Fire is cool but can't stand to re read 14, soon to be 15 books, then show them this book. It requires no knowledge of the world beforehand, and his mere two easy writing skills really shine through. All of the characters, even the background ones who only get a few lines like the glass blower, are full of light. And the main characters are all interesting, I never found myself growing because I stumbled upon a chapter where they are the main character, unlike Dragon Slayer. Darkstalker and Clearside's dynamic is very interesting, both of them are powerful dragons in their own right, and even though they do love each other, they are constantly fighting and outwitting each other using their visions. Whiteout is amazing, she's really smart, I'm convinced she could mask if she wanted to, but doesn't because not masking filters out all the idiots. Also, all of her prophecies have turned out to be true, and every single thing she says has a deeper meaning, I swear. Darkstalker's rise to becoming evil was hidden from the reader at first, just like Clearsight and Fathom. You don't know how truly bad he is until he kills Arctic and scrolls revealed. It's great for rereads, as you question whether his thoughts are about what is happening, or has a second meaning about his dark side. I think it comes as no surprise that this is the first book that is going into my S tier. Even if you are not a Wings of Fire fan, you are likely to enjoy this book. That's all. According to my calculations while writing the script, this video might end up being 32 minutes long, so thanks for sticking with me. Here's my final rankings. You are free to disagree with me on this, and it is just my opinion, and all opinions are valid to discuss in the comments. Just please keep it civil down there. If you are new to this channel, please think about subscribing. I regularly post Wings of Fire and Warrior Cats content so you'll never be bored. And to my current subscribers, thank you so much for supporting me. Without further ado, Rogan out.